Welcome back to another episode of RNT Fitness Radio and today I'm joined here live with Mr. K-Mac to talk all about the different stages of change you'll go through during a transformation. It's a little different to the phases we talk about in the RNT journey and instead this discussion we have is based on the trans theoretical model which is a psychological theory from the 80s that's been used in many fields to help the process of altering problematic behavior patterns such as smoking, eating junk food or a sedentary lifestyle. Through this We also discuss our own personal experiences of letting go of perceptions, comparisons and other limiting beliefs that we've been guilty of of, that's taken us down spirals of paralysis by analysis and spinning our wheels for years. So without further ado, let's dive in. Today we've got a a new sponsor on the show and it's Bulldog. Uh, Kate, Kate, we're recording this one live, and Mr. K Mac gave me a bottle of bull, Bulldog um, to take my my beard transformation to the next level. Apparently, uh, so K Mac, tell the listeners uh, what what the magic is in this in this Bulldog and why I need to use this in this phase of my uh, of my training under you. <laughs> <laughs> so Akash is in what six months of his uh, beard growth phase, and it's like creatine basically. <laughs> 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 oh my God. He's gonna fuel his his beard. If you guys are not, because you guys can't see this, his beard is actually grown. I'm actually very proud right now. <laughs> Just to get his beard is really really good. You'll see at the webinar tomorrow. But his beard is amazing. So shout out to our sponsor Bulldog. <laughs> yeah, no, <it's> just... <laughs> so I would I would call it amazing. I mean that's that's a long way to go. Nah, it's getting there. Yours yours is amazing right now. Yeah, okay, but I put in years of <laughs> you put in years of, <laughs> of growth, it. right? Um, but you know what? When I was in Iceland last week, I was in the Blue Lagoon, right? Yeah. And in the water, it contains silica. Mm-hmm. Now, they say before you go into the Blue Lagoon, you have to put conditioner in your hair <laughs> <laughs> to prevent your hair going wiry. So I put I put conditioner in my on my head, but I didn't put it on my beard. So, so, so I just didn't realize, right? And... Uh, so then I came out of it, you know, I had a shower, dried off. And then ever since then, like even now, it's been wiry, it's been wiry as hell. Like I'm, I'm just like itching it all the time and it's I'm trying to form knots. Um, but yeah, it's just, that's uh, why, that's why the beard was so, perfect. Yeah. It's almost like it's in the universe that like you bring uh, yeah, the, bull- just today, I just the little you know bulldog in, in your pocket today. <laughs> yeah. I just thought, I was like, you know what? I was liking his beard in the TV <laughs> the other day. I think it's now time to step it up with a new supplement. Yeah, so we were talking about um, the the different colours. So Kunal's got a very opaque, uh, yeah. opaque beard at the moment. Mine's in that translucent phase, which is not bad. <laughs> so it's in that middle ground. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the aim is to get to that opaque phase where it just looks like a black bit on your bit on your face. But um, mine's a bit too dark, right? Ah, it's good, man. It's good. Looking forward. The, the right front now. is it's got like a ginger face to it. Yeah, yours is growing different colours now. Yeah, I, I've never dyed it by the way. So if people yeah. see this and they're like, "Do you dye it?" I don't. <laughs> it, it just turned out that way. I'm not sure why, but here yeah. we are. Cool. So today, uh, we're not just talking about beards. <laughs> Imagine the whole podcast. <laughs> yeah, we're not just beard talk. We probably, we probably will have one one day um, and, and lose all our female listeners. If, if the clients want it. And lose all our female listeners in the process. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, but in the meantime, what we're going to be talking about today is something that uh, we've been discussing uh, between us, and it's the the trans theoretical model of, of change and the different stages that people go through. And we weren't talking about it in the context of this specific psychological theory that comes out in the research. We were just bouncing ideas about how uh, different people uh, go through the journey and the different psychological state they're in. And Kunal's uh, got a background in sports psychology at university and, uh, I also studied a little bit of sports psychology at university. So we did a little bit of the research and the, and the theories behind uh, some of this stuff. And and he mentioned the trans theoretical model and he actually wrote an article on it. And, and there's five different stages, which, um, which range from pre-contemplation to contemplation to preparation to then action, uh, maintenance and termination. So actually six stages. Um, and... And when we dug into it a bit more and we looked into the, the research over it and we looked into the theories, there's so many parallels that we could draw uh, with the clients that we work with and the people that we see on a day-to-day basis and, and their own journeys and how they evolve as they go through through the years and, and the months and the years. So we're going to spend today talking about these six stages and 
And what I, what you'll notice is as you're listening to it, you'll probably find yourself relating to certain areas mm -hmm. and being able to think, okay, I think I'm in this area right now. I'm in this stage. Uh, and we're also going to be talking about how we transition through the stages and how you can also go backwards. It's not always a forward It's, it's always a forward loop. Exactly. It's a, it can go front and back. So why don't you kick it off by talking about the first phase, uh, which is uh, pre-contemplation. Yeah, so first stage. So basically, before all this, I, I actually learned this in uh, university. And we were talking about weight loss and how people go through these changes. Um, so shout out again to all my lecturers from obviously three, four years ago, uh, because without them, I wouldn't know about this. But what I learned is a lot of people jump through these stages uh but from the beginning it's all about pre-contemplation so you're thinking about what changes you're going to make a lot of people actually they've got thinking they're thinking oh you know what? i need to do this i need to do that however they don't actually get to do it so it's a case where you don't do it if you're if you're listening to this and you're thinking i need to do it but i haven't done it there's no trigger yeah. there is there is no why for you um so you need to look into okay a bit deeper than i need to lose fat where I've had people say, you know what, I just need to lose fat, but why do you want to lose fat? That's a question you got to ask yourself. Yeah, so the pre-contemplation phase is like when you know you need to make change, yeah. but you don't make any change. You're just kind of stuck in that, that no man's land where nothing's really happening. You, you know something should be done, but there's no real reason for you to do it. There's no, the pain isn't more. Yeah. Than, it's all talk. Yeah, there's no, there's no real reason. And, and, it, and one of the questions I used to always ask when I was a personal trainer um, in the city is the, during the, the kind of consultation, I'd say to them, why do you want to be here? And they'd say something generic, like you just yeah. mentioned, I want to lose some body fat. I was like, no, why do you really want to be here? Then they might say something a little bit more. And then I said, what was the, what was the switch that flipped for you that made you pay money? Because it's not cheap. And so why did you, <laughs> why did you depart with all this money? What was the real reason? There's always a flip, right? Mm -hmm. And the pre-contemplation phase is knowing when, is when you've been, you know you should change, but there's not been that flip or that trigger that yeah. you mentioned. And when that trigger happens, that's when you move to the next phase, which is the contemplation phase. That's and when your why is, is triggered and you start... You start thinking about you it. You start thinking more and more about it. Maybe people around you are doing something similar. Yeah. Um, so you think, you know what, I should do it. But again, that's when you, you start inquiring about certain things. You start looking for personal trainers. Um you want to join the program. It's when you start surfing the net a bit more. You exactly. start reading magazines, yeah. scrolling Instagram and Facebook. You might be watching YouTube videos. You might yeah. be, if you're, yeah, when I was, I was in that stage at university and I was looking at YouTube videos as a way of, okay, this is mm -hmm. what I need to do possibly to be like this guy. Um, and I was watching this person, this person read magazines. Um, however, I wasn't thinking about, okay, I need to do this next stage. It was a case where I just needed to do this to begin with. Um, it says forming habits to begin with. So the pre, I'd say the contemplation phase is more, you're still in that thinking zone. Mm -hmm. It's not quite the habit zone yet. I'd say it's more the thinking zone. And it's when the pain points, you've established the pain points, you've established the reasons why you might need to change. Uh, and, but you're still sitting on the fence. It can switch within two weeks. So, yeah, so exactly. You yeah. can be like yeah. one, one week ago, uh, you could be completely fine. And then next week you go to the doctors and they you get diagnosed with diabetes. Yeah, that's a trigger. Yeah, you're that's like, an extreme one, but yeah, exactly. that's exactly it. But it, it does happen, right? It yeah. just happens. So very, very quickly you're like, I need to change my life drastically. Yeah. So those changes happen quite quickly as well. So you start doing little things like, okay, I'm going to drink a bit more water. Yeah. Or I'm going to eat a bit more protein or whatever the small habit is. But it's so easy and so low commitment that it's not going to be enough to be a life changer. Yeah, it's not going to be enough to change your life or change your body or really create anything significant. All it's going to do is give you that little bit of confidence, um, but you're still lacking something yeah. and you're still lacking direction. Exactly. Yeah. And you're lacking clarity of what you need to do. Yeah, most people are stuck in this stage for a long time. Yeah. Because you, you're, you're thinking, I'm doing enough. But the truth is, are you doing enough? And if you're listening out there, like question yourself, are you doing enough? And if not, what do you do next? Yeah, because the worst thing, I, in my opinion, the worst thing to do is to be putting so much effort into one thing or putting some effort into something, but you're never really achieving anything. So exactly. whether you're someone who's doing a little bit or you're doing loads, if you're still trying to work towards a goal, but you're lacking that clarity, you're lacking that vision, you're lacking the, lacking the, the confidence in doing it, then 
why not move into that next phase? But it's important to be in this phase because this is where so a lot of people happens. will be exactly. It's where the growth happens. It's where the starting. Um, that's where the start of your journey really takes on. And talk us through how you get to the preparation phase then. So preparation phase. So put it this way, I remember when I was in that phase, it was just going to the gym. I had no structure, by the way. So I was doing every machine possible in the gym with my white baggy top and shorts. Right, I was like this chubby fat kid went in the gym. But again, I was in that stage for a long time. It was until after is when I started looking into certain things. Okay, this is what I need to do in the gym. And that's what YouTube videos helped. Mm. It's just you're looking for inspiration yeah. um, in other avenues. And I'm just like, okay, I'm going to the gym. And that's a good habit to form. However, it was like I went into it and I said, this is the guy I need to look like or this is who can help me. And that's why I go into the the preparation, obviously, preparation stage. Now, the preparation phase is is when you're ready to take action. Yeah. And it's when you only start accumulating small wins. <laughs> Love the small wins. <laughs> yeah, the small wins. But, again, it's not enough to create the transformations that we, we see in our, in our clients. It's more it's more gathering a little bit more momentum. So if you've if in the contemplation phase you're on the fence, you've done the low commitment work, you, you, you're, but you're still lacking something, the preparation phase is when you you start you want to going to the gym more often, yeah, yeah. You, it's in your diary four times a week, you're, you're creating those small wins, but you're still overwhelmed at what you should really be doing. Mm -hmm. And you might do it something for like a couple of weeks and, and you then up. you give up and you go back into the contemplation phase. Because that's when the yo-yo happens. Exactly. I think another case is yo-yo dieters, fad dieters are the biggest. This is where they stop. Yeah, it's classic. Yeah, this is like, if you've done like paleo, you've done keto, you don't know any other way If apart from that. Like if you think, okay, I'm going to do keto for four weeks. What do you do after four weeks? It's done. Do you introduce carbs back in? What do you do? So as... Yeah, like, and they just give up because exactly. you're overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah. So you, you might lose four kilos. You think, oh my God, amazing. But... Then you go back to your old phase and you put all that back on. Then what do you do? So yo-yo dieters are the biggest. This is where they get stuck the most. Yeah. And, and the yo-yo dieters are, are yo-yo dieters because they fall for that shiny object syndrome yeah. and they want to find the latest fad. And, and like you just said, so they, they get quick small wins, then they get overwhelmed and they don't really have a lifestyle solution. So they go back into the, the, the contemplation phase and they're sitting on the fence again. They're dwelling in their pain points but they don't have the clarity yeah. to take it forward. They love excitement and fitness is quite boring, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah? Yeah, fitness yeah. is very boring. If you, yeah. if you do the boring things really well, yeah. you will have a transformation. But for most people, they want excitement, whether it's a diet, it's whether low carb, high fat, paleo, like those things, they sound very exciting. And obviously every magazine, you think about from like 2000 onwards, it's been, oh yeah, how this person lost this amount of weight following this diet and it's usually just like oh low carb yeah. but they've just taken out a macronutrient and that's it but they don't actually tell you the secret it's just calories in versus calories out exactly and it, it's not just the nutrition it's also in training as well like yeah. you know i always talk about the biggest mistake that i see in in in, in people in the gym is program hopping mm -hmm. and the fact that people don't stick to a program uh, for longer than four to six weeks and there's the constant need to try the new try the new phase try the new program and because they're constantly hopping between them, they never actually develop the the confidence and the motor neuro, motor patterns uh, and, and actually get stronger. Yeah, I had a call with one client and he told me, so first thing he said to me, it's taken me about six weeks to get ready. I mean, get used to the program. Uh, and I was training program. I said, okay, cool. And then two minutes later he goes, when are we changing the program? <laughs> and I said to him, okay, so what did you tell me two minutes ago? He said it took you six weeks to get ready for this program. How long do you think it will take you to get ready for the next program? Yeah. Right? You need to settle down, master this program, and milk it until you're very, very strong. Like, you won't be strong in six weeks. Um, you'll make some great changes, and you, like you said, gather up small wins, but <laughs> you need to kind of stick to it. Like, I've stuck to my program since, what, May of 2018? It's been a long time, but again, I'm still getting stronger each week. Um, again, progress of overload is key. That's our mantra. Yeah, progressive overload with perfect form, sticking to the right diet that works for your lifestyle. If you can combine those two things, Got you're going to be well on your way to a transformation. Okay, so we're into that we're in that preparation phase. 
Now, how do we get from there to the action phase, which is the next one? So this is the, the classic, which is done, been to the gym now for a number of years, done a lot of work, but never got anywhere. So it's been a lot about clients, like perfect examples, probably, you probably won't mention me, men- like wouldn't mind mentioning Nimelan. His quote is amazing, uh, achieve more in like 16 weeks than 10 years. And that's a, that's a true transformation. And again, he was spinning his wheels for 10 years, didn't know what he was doing. Uh, and suddenly, 16 weeks later, he's got his best physique ever. Uh, and that, that's not by mistake. Um, so again, it's just a lot of people have been in this stage where uh, it's again, just spinning your wheels, paralysis by analysis, um, hopping on training programs like you mentioned. Uh, but the good thing is you've been in the stage, you've made a habit now mm. to go to the gym. So that's a pro. That's a really good pro. Yeah. And those are the people that stick with the preparation phase and don't have the relapse. Yeah. So that when they're in the preparation phase, they they probably were jumping from program to program, but they didn't get demoralized or overwhelmed to the point where they'd relapse mm-hmm. back to contemplation. They'd stay with it and end up making it something that they do on a regular basis and they become the guys that focus on the process. So they're ticking all the boxes. They're just ticking the wrong boxes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and they just keep ticking different boxes every, every week and every month. But what they do is while they make, while they make some progress, they, they're not very productive in it. Yeah. Uh, and you know, like you said, they, they, they'll spend 10 years getting to like a, something they can do in four months. They might overthink a lot of the processes. Yeah. It's think. the classic overthinker. They get yeah. stuck into action phase. So mm-hmm. if you're, yeah, if you're an overthinker that always questions every little detail, uh, worries about all the different data that might be there, uh, looking into too many things closely, which is great. It's all great if you know how to read it properly and you can stay less emotional about it. I mean, again, you'll get fatigued by it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, just fatigue, it's like, tiring. Yeah. yeah, it's just tiring. You're just thinking, oh, I need to change this. I need yeah. to do this. Oh, can I have this food instead because I think it's going to be better for me? It's like you're thinking way too much without executing. Yeah, these are some of the uh, most my most favorite people to work with actually because they're the ones that are they 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 love training. Yeah, you, they typically love training. It's a habit now. It's part of their. It's it's something they do, but they're just so frustrated and they just want to see results and they want their results to match the efforts they put in for the last ten years and they want to see something for it. What it is they don't have systems beforehand. Yeah, and then once they get system, that's when the results happen. Uh, I've had, I work a couple of guys that are like the same thing. They are working hard for a number of years and then suddenly they jumped on a program, uh, a bit of coaching, and then here they are in the best shape ever. So it's just, it's a case where you need a system and the system will deliver for you. It's just, you got to execute at the same time. Yeah, exactly. So we're now in the action phase. This is when you're ticking the boxes. How does one get to the next one? And I would probably say this is, this is probably the hardest transition here yeah from action to maintenance this is this is when you pretty much at that stage where you either like done well with your results uh but you need something else another excitement um so a lot of it could be just a photo shoot you could book a photo shoot and say you know what i'm going to challenge myself a bit further i'm going to go here and say you know i've got photo shoot booked in three months time i'm going to push myself the, the hardest i've ever done and if you do that it'll be game changer for you and the maintenance is really truly it's in the name you're maintaining this habit and you want to make it a lifestyle mm. uh, a lot of people sometimes think oh am i done it doesn't work like that um because you're going to go back to your old habits very very quickly and then you'll be back to square one within a couple of months it's that quick you can go back yeah there's no on and off switch this yeah there's never on and off switch so the maintenance phase, maintenance stage is a lifestyle and, and you made a good point there in that it's maintenance of a habit yeah. it's not maintenance in how you look this is maintenance of a habit and just for the listeners uh, here the, the five the six stages we're talking about aren't related to the five phases that we talk about yeah. in the R&T journey that uh, Nathan and I discussed uh, two episodes ago this is this is a trans theoretical model and we're just going through the different stages here so the maintenance here is maintenance of a habit and it's very much when it becomes part of a lifestyle uh, and when you'll be getting, you've probably got good results now. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, you are at very high risk of relapse. And you're still. comfortable as well. You're yeah, very you're- comfortable. Let's say if you drop 10 kilos and you know you've got another 10 to go, 
you'll be very comfortable at that stage. So you need something to trigger you and say, you know what? Yeah. I, I, that's why I love my clients when they book a photo shoot because it just tells them, okay, you know what? You're motivated to do something really, really good in the next three months. However, again, you need to do that in order to sometimes you need excitement. I've had a lot of guys who've just been, you know, each week is trading along, trading along. Nothing's really happening. And it's that sense of boredom they get. And then you have something like, oh yeah, got a photo shoot by the way in three months time. And then suddenly like, holy crap, I need to check in. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to tick every box yeah. to get a result. I mean, and once you get a result, it's, it's amazing because you see that camera, you see the pictures and you're like, holy crap, was that me? Yeah, we were just talking about this before. Uh, we got on the call and how uh, I had a client who was stuck at the same body weight for yeah. three three months. And then he's like, he starts, January comes around and he said, I want to do a shoot uh, before before my birthday or before he goes away in April. And all of a sudden he dropped four kilos in January, <laughs> four kilos in March. And we're recording, sorry, in February. And we're recording this midway through March and he's down two kilos again. It's amazing. It and it, all it was, was just the, the flip the switch. I mean, he was stuck in that, that uh, maintenance, maintenance stage of the habit, but he still wasn't where he wanted to be. Um, so he needed that, extra level of accountability there yeah but at the same time we also said that uh, when you're in this period a period of time where the habits maintained you've got good results you're still at a high risk of relapse you can still fall back right the way back you can actually go from here mm -hmm. all the way back to pre-contemplation and that's when you get guys who are in great shape for years and then they come and then something hits them so it's either i don't know a, a breakup or work's changed they've changed their jobs they've moved house or something in their life has drastically changed and all of a sudden that maintenance of a habit just vanishes sometimes you need a breakup <laughs> <laughs> sometimes some like that trigger you need it in order to go but what it can do at this point is it could just it can it because it's already a habit mm -hmm. it can actually take them off yeah so for a lot of people these sorts of things can be a trigger to start but if you're in the maintenance stage it can actually be a trigger to stop mm -hmm. 100%. Because you get people who say, okay, I've, I've had to move house. Uh, I can't I can't train anymore. Why not? Yeah, exactly. Like, why is this? There's why, gyms everywhere. There's gyms everywhere. But there's also, if, if you have a system in place, then a real system, then your environment shouldn't matter. Exactly. Matter at all. Which is why there's still one more stage to go towards. And, big, and why the maintenance stage. isn't the, the, the end the point. One, yeah. and, and the end point is termination now termination doesn't mean you finished <laughs> a lot of people right now listen to me thinking, holy crap i'm done thank you goodbye but you know. termination doesn't mean finish termination means termination of a bad habit yeah perfectly said i actually stole that from you <laughs> <laughs> i take credit for that yeah. so basically your habit is, is terminated and you never go back this is our long-time client so akash has worked with a lot of clients you've known about you work with clients for like over four or five years and you realize, okay, these guys will probably never go back to old habits. And you work from the beginning, which was the start of the change. And you've gone through the whole change and where they've maintained that change. Um, so if you break this habit and you make fitness a lifestyle, I doubt you'll ever go back and you'll only get better each week. Exactly. Each, each year as well. <clears throat> yeah. If you make it to stage six, then it's a lifestyle habit. And that's probably where we are now yeah. for ourselves. Like, mm -hmm. We're probably never going to go back to a play contemplation phase where we're deciding whether we should train this month or not. <laughs> it's just not going to happen, right? It's it's just part of our lifestyle. We've we've got rid of that bad habit of not of um, of not being active, but that's something I've done over ten years ago, and something you've done nearly that ten years yeah, ago as well. So I get anxiety if I if you told me we're not training for like a month. Yeah, exactly, because it's just not part of your lifestyle. Yeah. So the termination of the habit is where you really want to be to really want to get to, and to make that transition between maintenance and termination is very much a case of continuing to think back to your why, continuing Always. to maintain accountability and combine those two together to allow you to propel yourself into that uh, termination phase where it becomes seamless with your lifestyle. Yeah, accountability provides systems as well. Yeah. So it's the, the accountability allows you to create a system. It says, okay, you know what, if I check in with him or her, um, it tells me, okay, I need to do this, this, this this week in order to get that result. Um, if you don't, it's a case where you don't actually get a result and then that system is broken. So make sure, systems are always linear sometimes. Um, it's a case where if you keep doing the same thing week in, week out, and that's why it's boring. That's why a lot of people don't get excited sometimes when you tell them, 
hey, by the way, good work. Uh, you've got this to do next week. It's boring. It sounds boring, right? Yeah. But in magazines, it said, oh my God, you need to do this, this, yeah. this to drop X amount. It just doesn't make sense. I've read like so many magazines like, I don't know what. It just doesn't make sense. I remember Nimmerland in this podcast mentioned about the 40 pounds in six months magazine he read. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I've read loads of magazines as well and I'm like thinking, okay, this is bullshit. But I don't get why it's out there. To me, it always comes down to this. Do you want to be entertained or do you want to get results? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. I mean, most people exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's exactly that, right? Mm. And uh, it's something I've said to so many people. And they make, you, know, you get people who are making amazing progress on a, on a program. They make, their strength is flying up. Yeah. And they're like, okay, six weeks is up. I need to change your program. So why? Why would you want to make a change at this point? This is yeah. the time to ride it out. Drop five kilos in six weeks and they want to change things up. Yeah, but it's more, the, I'm talking more from a programming point of point. Yeah. Uh, you know, like the first four to six weeks on a training program, you're all making neuromuscular gains, uh, ne- sorry, neurological gains. Mm-hmm. The muscular gains don't come yet. They come when you've built those neurological connections and that's when your muscles get stronger. So if, if after four, four to six weeks, you get, you're making great strength gains, which is to be expected, and then you suddenly decide to stop. You're not going to change programs and, and all you're going to do is rebuild more neurological connections. Exactly. You're not actually going to build the muscle, which is why if you stick through it, after six weeks, that's when the muscles start working and that's when they get overloaded and that's where progressive overload counts for so much and when you can actually build muscle and make changes to your physique. And you've gone through it, right? So you had loads of program hopping, you used to change programs quite a lot. What did it cause? Just injuries, didn't get stronger... Yeah, it just causes, yeah, it cause, you know what it does? It causes fake progress. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, if you do four weeks on a program, you're going to get stronger on any pro. If you start any new program, you will always get stronger in four weeks because it's a new pro- it's a new stimulus. But it doesn't mean it's going to create progress. Because if you, let's say, for let's use a practical example. Mm-hmm. You're going to do the bench press, okay, flat bench press for four weeks. You start on 60 kilos and you end after four weeks, you end up on 70 kilos. Yeah, two, two and a half a week. Now you think, okay, great, four weeks are done. Got to change, the, change that exercise to incline bench press. So you're going to go to incline bench press, 50 kilos, you probably start on, a little bit lighter than the flat bench, and you end up in four weeks to 60 kilos. Of course you're going to make progress because you're learning the exercise again. And, and that learning process means the, the strength gains will go up. Okay, now you go back to the flat bench press and you'll probably be a little bit lower than 60 because you're relearning the movements. So you'll probably be at like 52.5. And, and you probably end up roughly around 60 at the end of it. Now, people will repeat this process over and over and they find they won't get anywhere. Yeah, this is where the action stages. Yeah. This is where they are all the time. All the time. And now there's, there's certain programs out there and ad, that are geared towards ad, really advanced trainees who, who are chasing strength development. Let's say, for example, Westside Barbell. For any of the listeners who know this, it's, it's probably one of the strongest powerlifting gyms uh, in the world. Oh, yeah. and, and their methodology is built around this rotation of exercises. But that is for super advanced people. And their neurological connection is so high. Uh, they're so neurologically advanced that they can learn movement patterns very quickly. And they can make progress through rotations. Now, their rotations are up to six to ten different exercises in a really weekly basis. I've done that program and I, I got no progress because I'm not, I wasn't neurologically advanced enough to do that. And did you get injuries? I didn't get injuries off right now. I didn't, I didn't get that. I did, it was more just, um, every time I came back to the exercise, I felt like I was learning it again. I didn't pick it up quickly. So when I did that, when I did a variation of that program, I kept the exercises for three to four weeks and then I'd, I'd rotate on a, on a two to three exercise basis. And I still found I was, wasn't making progress. And then I decided, let me just keep the same indicator exercise and just vary the reps. And that's when I made progress. And this isn't to say that the program is bad because the program has produced some extremely strong people. Strongest, right? Yeah, some of the strongest people. But it's for the right person. And from, for if you're a beginner, you're an intermediate, and you're even if you're an early advanced, and, and probably for most advanced people as well, Yes. And like, unless you're super advanced, but for most advanced people as well, you probably need to stick to a, uh, an exercise for a while in order to make progressive strength gains on it. Yeah, and most people should. Yeah, because you're likely not going to be neurologically in- efficient enough to be able to rotate different exercises and still make progress. 
All you'll end up doing is spinning your wheels with different exercises, creating fake progress and entertaining yourself and not getting results. Yeah. That's where you spend action stage, right? You spend quite yeah, a lot. I spent years doing that, which is why that's a, all, the, all the things I talk about now are all the mistakes it's, I made yeah. repeatedly. Learn from my mistakes. So basically. program hopping or trying fad diets or cutting out macronutrient groups or uh, what other ones? Only relying on the big three. So big three, I mean squat, bench, and deadlift, and in their traditional forms. Supplements. I used to buy so many supplements, <laughs> and I've done everything you can think. Talk of. about the worst one you bought. I mean, there's one thing I, I did. I uh, I think I spent. I, it was it was um, HCL. So this, again, it's very dependent. I don't want to make a blanket statement and say no one should take HCL, but I didn't need to take HCL. Okay, so you know, I was 20 years old. My digestive system was completely fine. But I thought the reason why I wasn't growing, this, this is what's funny about it. The reason why I wasn't growing was because I wasn't taking HCL. <laughs> so I remember I, was a, I sent a check to someone, to, to, to a supplement shop in Devon or something like that, to, to ship me this HCL to the university. Yeah. Now, firstly, I don't know how I afforded this at the university, but I clearly spent all my money on supplements. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is that I was always in search for that magic potion or the magic button, magic pill. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that all I was doing wrong was I just wasn't eating enough to grow muscle and I wasn't sticking to a program. I was changing my program every, every couple of weeks and I was taking multiple supplements, neither of which were conducive to my goals. All that needed to be done was a structured plan. Just wasting money, right? Yeah, I was wasting money. I was wasting time. And you know, those periods at university and, and I talk about university a lot because that those were my years. Um, where, which which is a while ago now, like it's, <laughs> but those years were golden. No, 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 no. The thing is, they weren't golden for my training. They but should no, have been. They should have been golden for my yeah. training because that's the time when you've got no stress in your life, mm. and no responsibilities, and you could just train and eat um, outside of being a student as well. But it's the perfect time to grow. But I didn't grow much because all I was doing was. Uh, being completely paralyzed with all the information out there i would spend nights i would i would uh if, if i wasn't out at night i'd be in i'm on my laptop <laughs> researching different programs and different methodologies and why this program now that's great for learning because i think a lot of that is what's helped me become a good coach in in that i can I, i've now learned what's what i shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. but for my own personal progress it was a like a complete uh, I don't know what the word is for it, but paralysis, paralysis by analysis, basically. Yeah, I was paralyzed. I was, I was, I was in paralysis by analysis, but that was a complete roadblock to my progress, mm -hmm. and that uh, I didn't really make the progress that I should have made. And then it was only towards the latter stages where I was like, let me just stick to a. Let me just. I started to learn the benefits of sticking to a program, and it was over a summer summer holiday period. I started training with uh, two of my best friends, Sharma and Minil, and we just did the same program for the whole summer. And that was three, four months long. And that's when I thought, oh, there's something to this. There's something to this program. This program, no, I thought this program is the best program ever. <laughs> Even then you're still stuck. I thought this program is the best program ever. <laughs> I'm going to do this one for ages. And then what I ended up doing is I believed so much in the program. I just carried on doing that same program. And I realized the, the real magic was just the fact that I was sticking to a plan for the first time in my life. And that goes back to actual habit. Yeah. Just stick to the habit. And when I realized that all I was doing was sticking to a plan, that's when it clicked that all I really needed, the, the real secret to success is consistency, consistency, which is where the whole ruthless consistency phrase came from. Because I realized that nothing else matters more in transformation than consistency. And it's so boring to talk about, but it's, it, it's, all, it's all that really does matter. And that was my learning process that I had to go through to understand that. And it took me five years to do it. Boring works. Yeah. And you know, the, the five years of entertain my, entertaining myself it didn't really res uh, reap many um, benefits except for my own learning process, which, you know, is why we're here today. But I just had a thought. One of the, <laughs> you need to tell you about the magazines. There was one uh, workout that sticks to mind. What, which it's one? It's called the 300 workout. Okay. Okay. It was in men's health. And, uh, I must have seen it. I think the film 300 just came yeah. out and I saw the 300 workout just dropped. <laughs> so, you know, what? I scrapped my current program. I was like, now look, I've got to look like these guys in 300. Right. And, uh, I had to do 300 workout. And what it was is you do basically 300 reps in the workout. <laughs> <laughs> but not the same oh exercise, just 300 reps. <laughs> 
<laughs> so he'd be like, uh, uh, <laughs> he'd be burnt out. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just, no, but that's not that many reps, but it's just the concept of it. Like, yeah. It's just like, okay, I'm doing 300 reps now. Like, why? There's no, there's no there's magic about 300 reps. It's just, I'm doing 300 reps. Just because of movie. <laughs> 300. So I was doing like, um, I think it was like three by 20 or something similar on about five different, ex- three by 20, yeah, five different exercises. The three sets of 20, five different exercises. Which is quite brutal to be fair. Yeah. But it, after four weeks, I was like, all right, what's the next thing? It was the, and then I just waited for the next issue, issue to come out because I used to be subscribed to Men's Health. So <laughs> every, every month, every month there'd be a new, there'd be like, oh, I'm going to look like Hugh Jackman from Wolverine now. Or the Hugh, that was a workout as well, the Hugh Jackman workout. Or the 300 workout. So yeah, I've fallen prey to all of that stuff. And now, like, like you said, for yourself, uh, like I've been on the program, same program for ages. And, and I think you're still on the program that I think I gave you for your prep for yeah, last year's shoot. Yeah, yeah. And it's worked perfectly for me because... It's, it's my key indicator lifts down there. And I'm just getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And a lot of people tell me as well, um, hey, when can I change my program? And I said, you've been in it for like four weeks. There's nothing, no no reason to change. Just the reason what you said. Uh, but going back to your like days at uni, what was the worst diet you had? Or what what's the worst diet you followed? Um, I would say it was the... So what I did, I was trying to get lean. Yeah. So I was, I didn't eat carbs for about a year. <laughs> no, no joke. I didn't eat them for about a year. And this is at uni as well. I had no idea why I did this, but okay. So I lie. It, it wasn't a no carb diet. It was a no carb with a cheat day diet. So you've heard, you've heard this classic thing. Yeah, right? yeah. So you do, it was this whole thing where you do six days, six and a half days of no carbs, but high, high fat. Okay. <laughs> and then you have a meal off, right? Yeah. And the meal off me, whatever you want. But during these six and a half days, so I, I expected to lose body fat, but I didn't really lose any body fat because what I was doing was I was eating so much fat that my calories were just made up. So I was doing things like chicken salads and then I'd grate loads of cheese on top. And then I'd add, I literally add a slab of butter. Oh, wow. Like I, and if I weighed it, if I look at it, if I think back to what it was, it was probably about 30 grams of butter and I just stack it on the top, <laughs> let it melt in <laughs> and then just devour that. Right. And, uh, and then and my snacks would just be like a big handful of nuts. And it was all just a nut. I was going through, I was going through th- th- um, three jars of nut butter a week. Oh, wow. That's expensive. That's wow. expensive. And so I don't know what, my budget was just all, everything I spent was going towards um, food. food and um, supplements. I was trying to grow <laughs> while I was trying to lose body fat. And I couldn't make my mind up. This is another problem. Right? Exactly. I could never make my mind up. I was like, am I growing now or am I losing body fat? So then I thought, let me try and do both. So I I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd drop carbs and then I have cheat days. It was all over the place. You were with a classic. Um, I want to be eighty kilos, uh, shredded, big lean. Yeah, big I mean, you know what? So I was once told by someone that uh, in order to be a good coach, I have to be eighty five kilos, ten percent body fat. And at the time, I was seventy three kilos, about twelve percent body fat, which is not bad. Twelve fifteen percent. Yeah. So I was thinking to myself, that's a long way to go, but I'll get there. <laughs> 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 and then but the problem with that was it created so much pressure on me and stress because I was thinking I need to do I need to find the latest thing I need to find the best thing I need to be the best thing make sure that I'm not cutting any corners here but what I ended up doing was spinning my wheels and uh, what I didn't realize and I think I talk about this in the how heavy will you be in article I talk about this um, this this conversation I had and how at the time it caused me stress but once I realized that that was never actually going to happen I was never going to be 85 kilos, 10 percent body fat. Naturally, yeah, just wasn't going to happen. What I didn't realize at the time was he was obviously suggesting PEDs. Something else, yes, but I had no idea. I was naive, and I just thought, yeah, you can get there. All these guys are not. There's no <laughs> such thing as steroids. Everyone's uh, everyone's natty. Everyone's natty, and everyone's natural. 90 kilos, 10 percent body fat. That's that's normal. And I had no idea, but I had no idea how much steroids is in the industry and. When I, when I did realize that, then it relieved a lot of pressure on myself. Uh, and I started to just enjoy the process. And you could say that was when I was in my, I started to transition into that kind of termination phase. And, you know, because of, uh, you know, I was always growing up as a skinny kid, a mm-hmm. skinny fat kid. So I always uh, compared myself to these guys who were jacked and in great shape and, you know, the movie stars and, also just like people around me who I looked up to in the industry, like 
you know, when I was growing up, I was looking up to all these guys on T Nation and, and Elite FTS and all these guys, and they're all massive. And I was like, how am I not getting there? Like, I'm doing everything they're doing. I'm doing the same program. Yeah. I'm eating, the, I'm eating the food. Why am I not getting to 90 kilos? Why are you eating the same food as they were? Like, why am I not getting to 100, why am I not getting 120 kilos lean? <laughs> <laughs> 120 kilos? No, why am I not getting there? Like, oh, all I'm doing, I'm staying, at, I'm staying at 73 kilos. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm going to get to 90 kilos lean. I, I got to 90 kilos in the end. I got to 90 kilos in 2017 for the first time. Uh, but I wasn't lean. Mm. It was ninety kilos. I, I dropped twenty kilos. To get lean. <laughs> <laughs> I remember but, seeing. I remember seeing you ninety kilos. Yeah, it's, 90, it's a different, ki- different, different Akash. Yeah, that was ninety kilos of pushing food hard, man. I was pushing food hard. I was training my ass off. I had the most muscle I ever had. I was going for it, but I still had about 15, 20 kilos of body fat to drop. Now, once I so at the time that you know, the naivety I had, where I thought everyone was on the same playing field. And this isn't to me, me to be here and start, you know, complaining about why people use. I don't care if people use um, if people use extra stuff. And I've been around a lot, a lot of it in the last ten years. You know, I've, you know it, it's everywhere, mm-hmm. and I've been around it. I've been offered it, but I've never really been drawn to it. But at the time, I didn't have no idea. I just thought I assumed everything was great, and I thought all these amazing like transformation something like you know bodybuilder transformation i'm seeing and that big and jacked and lean they're all getting i thought that that was all possible yeah you, you wanted to look like that so i kept comparing myself to that and it created a lot of stress and i had a lot of body dysmorphia around that i thought why am why am i not looking like that and i'm just a skinny fat kid over here like trying to trying to get <laughs> grow my best and i just can't get there and i think a lot of people struggle with this yeah, and guys struggle with it from the perspective of of jacked guys. You know, they want to be jacked like the guys on Instagram, or and they don't know the background, or they don't know what's really going on. Or and, and women get the same thing, and you know, they want to look like the girls on Instagram, and it's the same, and it causes so much stress. And I would say I only really got into. The, I know we, we're talking about the trans theoretical model, but we've kind of gone off track here. But uh, but it's good. I mean, it still relates. But I just want to link it back into this because I think it's important in that. I only think I got into the termination stage of losing the bad habits and making it a real lifestyle once I forgot all about mm. forgot about all of that and I forgot about comparing myself. I mean, once you accepted yourself? Yeah. And once I started accepting myself and my own body type and realizing that I'm running my own race here, I'm not comparing myself to anyone else, that... I can only improve my own body and I've just got to improve it. As long as I'm making positive, consistent forward momentum every day, then that's good. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not the most Jack guy. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not the biggest guy, but I've built a decent physique over the last 10 years and I've proven multiple times, especially last year in 2017, that I can get absolutely shredded. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing you can control is, is your condition. Your condition, yeah. Which is why, you know, when people worry about attachment to the scale in that they don't want to go below some body weight, I've never had that because I've always thought, I just want to get absolutely shredded. And like in 2017, you know, I had striated glutes, I had the feathers in my triceps. i have never been that lean, but... And you probably and never, beat people. Yeah, I, I was the heavy most shredded thing. person on the stage. But the only person, the guy who beat me on stage that day was uh, just bigger than me. And he had condition. He was just that 3D muscle, amazing physique. I couldn't control that. Yeah, you but I didn't. You know what? Five years before that, I would have been upset about it. But I wasn't upset at all. All I cared about that day and, and, and that dieting phase was beating the previous time I dieted. That's all I care about now. Yeah. I didn't care that I got beat that day because I can't control someone else's physique. That's There's, what bodybuilding is, right? Yeah. You're not actually... You're competing for a title, yeah, but at the end of the day, you're looking back on three years' time and saying, did I beat my condition? Did you have my look? Did I have more muscle? And you pretty much did, right, from 14 yeah, to My 17. goal was to have more muscle, which yeah. I did. I came in heavier than I did last time and leaner, mm-hmm. which is evident, and to get striated glutes, which I did. And I thought, okay, I've accomplished these two things. I'm happy. I don't. I didn't need to win anything I, to, to prove that to myself. And And... That was big progress for me because, you know, for myself, that was just the personal goal I'd hit and I'd accomplished it. Yeah. I mean, talking back about social media, though, imagine if we grew up in the era of like Instagram. Yeah. Right now, there's a lot of pressure as well. But you're talking about pressure just from guys telling you. you Guy, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine, I'm seeing it now, like 
Instagram is just it's just people's highlights of let's say five years ago or two years ago when they were shredded. Most people think they look like that all the time. Yeah, I think again, women see a lot because again, it's just bikini girls. I don't look like this. I don't look like that. You don't know what she's actually done. Even with guys, you don't know if he's on PEDs. Um, I like get a lot of natural guys from you. Hey, I don't look like this person. It's like, dude, he's on steroids. Uh, you're not going to look like that. Yeah. But even when I, so I was coming up in the era of like social media was growing. It wasn't quite what it was right now. Um, I'm lucky in that sense, I'll say, because I don't really look at social media. I don't look at Instagram and say, you know what? I don't look like this person. Then again, I follow good people. I follow people natural and things like that. So it's good. But people out there don't know what's natural and what's... Yeah, they don't. And, it, and it's, a, it's a real shame because it really does affect people's mindset yeah. and, and affects them. It can affect some people quite badly. And I think a lot of my early program hopping and in search for the magic pill was very much related to this. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, I was trying to, you know, I've been told I need to look like this and I was trying to stay up with these guys in the industry when I who I looked up to. And it wasn't until like I realized what was going on and I realized that all I can do is run my own race that I, I stopped that. And like now I'm, you know, the last five years, the first five years was all filled with that, which is probably why I just programmed all everywhere. And the last five years uh, was, uh, I'm completely, completely secure in it, in how I look. And yeah, well, my body fat will range up and down, but I know I can always rein it in. Yeah. And then, you know, if I want to build muscle, then I go through a bulking phase. If I want to, if I want to lean down, I can easily do it. I, I've got to the point where I completely control my body, but I'm, I'm secure in how I look. And I think that's a big part of making this a lifestyle and making this bulletproof in its strategy for the future. Because if you don't have that security, then you're always going to be at risk of going back into contemplation. Yeah. Cause you stopped sprinting and you ran it. You ran a marathon instead. That's what you did. Cause you actually said, you know what? I'm not going to compare everyone else. I'm just going to go hundred miles per hour. I'm going to go at my own pace. And that's what created security with you. And just the inner, yeah, you just create a security within you and say, you know what, I'm going to do it at my pace and I'm still going to go on the finish line. But then again, there's no finish line with fitness. There is no finish line. It's a case where, yeah, you're going to have ups and downs. Uh, motivation's going to up and down as well. But the habit would always stay. Um, again, that's why the stage of changes are quite, quite important in establishing where you're at. So if you're listening to this, that you can Google it and just have a look, okay, am I at this stage? Am I at that stage? Um, and understand where you're at. Yeah. I think it's, um, this model, like I, I haven't really thought about it much from a theoretical perspective. It's only when you mentioned it to me, uh, it made a lot of sense, but as we've just been talking just now, uh, I didn't really expect to cover some of these topics, <laughs> um, but it's very interesting how, I think a lot of it is a lot of moving through the phases and a lot of how susceptible you are to relapse is to do with the security and the self-awareness that you have in yourself. Mm-hmm. So environment matters as well. Yeah. Um, if you create the right environment around you, that's what I call about systems. Systems are quite important. If you don't have the right environment, you could easily go back to your old place. Like I say your friend's always going out and you're the only one who wants to change. Your environment, your friends will dictate sometimes how your change is going to be. So that's why sometimes, you know, when you see groups of friends join us, they if they're competing against each other, they generally do well because they want to get that result and then they make it a lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, whereas some people will be like, oh, you know what? My friends are not doing it. They're not supporting. I'm going to go back to my old habit. And we've seen that. I've seen that loads of times. But it's a case where once you're in the stage and you understand I'm in the maintaining stage and I've terminated it, and now this is now my habit for life, you're always going to get results no matter what. Even if you, like let's say you're going to go bulking phase and you feel like, oh my God, I'm not going to trained in a couple of months. And then again, it's, it's always a, it's a cycle rather than just a linear approach. That's, that's summed up perfectly. And it's, uh, this, is, this is a different type of journey. And I think this, a lot of this that we've discussed today is the journey that you go through psychologically. Mm-hmm we haven't really touched on. We've touched on the training and the diet, but we've talked, to him about, we've talked about it from a different angle. And 
it's 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 much more than just the training program and, and the diet plan because you've really got to master your psychology in order to take yourself through the different phases here. Yeah, your mindset is the key to your change. Uh, that's with anything, to be honest. Like, yeah. if you're an entrepreneur, you you have to understand this. Your mindset needs to be like this in order to progress with this. Anything, like even let's say if you're in school, your mindset has to be somewhere in order to get that grade that you want. Uh, you're you're not going to just get the best grade if your mindset is really bad, if you're always negative about it and things like that. So, your mindset is going to dictate your result ultimately. So, the psychology is really important. I think it's overlooked a lot in fitness, uh, but I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really important. Cool. So if there's anything else uh, you'd like to add about this? <laughs> <laughs> I think we talked a lot about it. Yeah, I think it was, uh, I think that was quality. And I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of value from this. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's something that's definitely worth sharing around with people and also revisiting. And we'll, we'll link a, we'll link a good article about the trans theoretical model into the show notes. Uh, it won't be written by us. It'll be written um, from a psychological journal but something easy to digest for people so they can get more further reading on this and, and see where they're at in, the, in, their, in their own journey and if they feel if you feel like you're if you feel like you're in the action phase and you want to make it into the maintenance phase you know you, you got to start thinking about the tools that you need to apply in order to get there and if you think you're in the maintenance phase but you want to really want to get into that uh, terminate you really want to terminate all the bad habits and you want to make it a lifelong uh, transformation then you really need to dial into your accountability systems, your your why, and your environment, and then clean your palate. <laughs> clean your palate, yeah. Clean your palate. That's that's a that's a whole different topic. Yeah, we, we love that. We love the palate, don't we? Um, but yeah. Uh, if for more information, please follow us on www.rntfitness.co.uk and to follow us on Instagram. Uh, you can catch us on at rnt underscore fitness. And before we actually go, let's um, let's do some rapid fire questions. Do you want to do them? Yeah, why not? Good. What should we say? Do you want to ask me? I thought you were going to ask me. Oh, where's your next uh, travel destination? Uh, next travel destination. Oh, this one is going to come out after after the next one, yeah. which is in Italy. So I'll, I'll do the one after. And that, that one's in Barcelona. Okay. End of April for my birthday with the boys. Hey. <laughs> We're looking forward to most this year. Hey, what about you? What's your what's yours? Uh, Italy as well. So I think I'm going a week after you. Yeah. Uh, with with good old Nate. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna bond. And I think it's Thailand next month. Oh, you booked it? Yeah. You done it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it, you booked it? Yeah, yeah. Where are you going? Uh, Phuket. Oh, nice. So we're we'll going there. Um, but that's that's pretty much it for the year. I don't know actually. I might think of going to New York in August. Oh, nice. Um, uh, but. Yeah, and the goal is still photo shoots, twelve and twelve. Um, that's my, that's my biggest goal this year, to be honest. I want to I want to hit that twelve and twelve. Yeah, yeah. Like you're doing twelve in twelve months. I might have to just sneak in twelve and twelve shoots as well, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To be fair, you do have quite a few, right? Yeah. So I want to try and get twelve and twelve, and then yeah, go from there basically. Nice. Uh, I'm just stuck another question. Biggest lesson you've learned so far in 2019. 2019 and it's only been uh, three months bro. oh wow it's only been three months man. yeah, yeah bro. uh ooh, that's a big one it's a good one there yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. good one uh ooh, biggest lesson in 2019 uh, i'd say it's, it's it, i think it actually comes down to what we spoke about earlier in um just slowing down a bit more and and if anyone, you know me, I, I work at 150 miles an hour. <laughs> You're a sprinter. Yeah. So, you know, the amount of emails I send you and <laughs> no, all hours and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think it's, it's just learning to a little bit, just to calm down a bit, because I know that I'm not indestructible. Mm-hmm. I've learned that I'm not indestructible. And if, I, if I'm not careful, then I will break. Burn so, out. Yeah. So I've got to... I thought that before, but I think uh, I think this year has already taught me that I need to slow down. That's probably my biggest lesson so far. Interesting. At the same time, I'd also say an equally good lesson is the importance of having an amazing team. So shout, <laughs> shout out to you boys, yeah. Okay, shout out to the team. Amazing team. Yeah. Um, any questions for me? Same thing. Biggest lesson I've learned so far? Yeah. It's similar to you, actually. Um... I probably sometimes I do a lot 
or just love being, I just love learning. So I might spend like hours and hours and hours just being on a laptop. And I might just need to like shut down sometimes. Um, like, you know me, right? I'll be like, oh, by the way, I listened to like three podcasts today on wherever it'd be, like peak week. It'd be, it'd be super random like that. Uh, it's good because I'm learning. However, I think I need to like slowly back off and... Yeah, you're going through that phase. That's a good phase to be in. I was, I was, I had that as well. Then I actually found that I was learning. I was, I was trying to absorb too much information. Yeah, and cool. I never actually applied it, mm-hmm. or I never actually sat and thought about it, because you're just always absorbing information and you're never actually processing and digesting it. So if I had advice for you, I would say keep doing that because it's great, but also spend time revisiting work and also putting it into practice and really spending time thinking about the stuff that you're learning. Yeah. Like that's why I, that's the biggest lesson I probably learned from you. I remember when we first met, you were like, if read what you're going to apply. I think I remember you said that to me early on. I think about a year ago this time, um, you mentioned it to me and said, you know what, this is what you need to do and make sure you can apply it. Don't just learn things for the sake of learning without ever applying it. Um, but at this stage, I'm like, yeah, I just need to listen to this podcast. I need to listen to this I need to read this book. This book is out. Um, like you said, it's good. However, if I can't apply it, sometimes there's no need for it. Yeah, yeah I think I think there's always going to be a, a need, yeah. But you always need to be learning. But you just need to learn what you need to. Is I think what learning comes in seasons, because you're always going to be drawn to what you think you need to fill in the most. Now. You mentioned peak week and you always mention you're learning stuff about how to do peaking. Yeah. And why do you think that is? Because you're trying to do 12 photo shoots. shoots and yeah, 12 yeah, yeah. I've, done, I've been the same phase when, I, when I've been slamming Peak week is such an interesting it's topic. It's such an interesting topic and it's one of the most overcomplicated yeah, topics yeah. ever. Uh, it's actually the most simple thing. Like you've learned. <laughs> like you tell me all these ex- ex- like really exciting strategies and I'm like, <laughs> you don't need to do that. <laughs> you just need to... Just... I'll be like, we were talking yesterday, right? You're talking about rapid backloading and all this stuff. I'm like, what? I was voice noting Akash and I was like, by the way, I think I'm going to rapid backload this person. Um, and he was like, by the way, that's not rapid backload. <laughs> and it's just one of those things where it's like, again, the shiny object syndrome yeah. can get to you where it's something different in my career right now. So it's just like, okay, yeah, make sure you learn this, make sure you master it, which is a good thing. But again, like you mentioned, always make sure you apply it or can apply it. What's the final question? Um, I'll ask you this one. Who should you have on the podcast next? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I like James Clear. James Clear is probably a good one. Uh, Atomic Habits. Yeah, that'd be a really good one. I think if we could try and get him on, that'd be great. Especially the stuff we've been talking about recently. Yeah, yeah. I think it could be a, a lot of value. We could actually share some ideas and see what he thinks of our our methodologies. Yeah, I think there's, he, a, lot, he loves, there's yeah. a lot of parallels there. Yeah, he loves talking about behavior change and how you can implement certain tasks and so on in the day. I think it'll be it'll be game changer for our clients. Yeah, James James Clear would be good. What about you? Who would you like? I don't think anyone was asked you, right? Nah, no, yeah. I've never been asked yeah, you. Who would you like next on the podcast? No, who's your dream guest? Dream guest? Oh wow, The Rock. <sighs> if you know what, as like cheesy as it might sound, with the industry that we're in and where I started learning from, it has to be Arnold. Oh yeah, now, that'd be my dream. My dream guest would be Arnold because we've never had a guest ever come on and say get Arnie next. Yeah, like, Arnie will be my ideal guest. Um, he was the guy that, he was the first body money book I ever bought I used to have him like I used to have all his books I used to still I read them for years like, I used to always dip into them there's some so much good stuff in there Pumping Iron no, yeah, Pumping Iron one of the best it was such a good movie but his encyclopedia of body the, the small book the Hello. first one that he wrote like in in the early 80s or late 70s I can't remember which one uh, Golden a Golden book amazing stuff um, and then obviously everything he's done is just quite is it, He's very, very inspirational, and um, yeah, he's he's the father, he's the godfather of uh, yeah, of godfather. fitness. Like without Arnold, the f- we wouldn't be here today without Arnold. Yeah, we true. wouldn't be doing what we do because he, he was the only bodybuilder I know. He, no, but he created the fitness industry yeah. essentially. Yeah, yeah. Like, he made it so mainstream that people could, normal people, could access it. So that would be my ideal, ideal uh, podcast guest, I'd say. You got me pumped here. I might actually watch Pumping Iron. You got to watch Pumping Iron. If you haven't, if you're listening to this now and you haven't seen Pumping Iron, that you need to make that your homework tonight. I thought you were going to say Dorian Yates as well. 
Nah, yeah, like, see, Dorian Yates is very interesting though. Yeah. I've actually listened to some of his podcasts um, back Joe in the day Rogan. with Joe Rogan and it's very interesting. So yeah, he'd be really interesting to speak to because he's had some of the most influence on my training. Yeah. My training methodologies have been influenced by Dorian heavily. So Dorian would definitely up there in the, in the fitness world, for the bodybuilding world, for sure. I love watching him train. Like this video, you just watch, you type in Dorian Yates, guys, on YouTube. And if you want to understand intensity, he's the definition of intensity. Definition, man. Like, he's insane. Um, I actually, yeah, in my gym, they actually play his DVD. <laughs> they play his DVD while we're training. Like, you can't hear anything, but they play Ronnie Coleman, they play Pumping Iron, and they play um, Dorian Yates' one. And speaking of uh, speaking of your gym, uh, just thought we let let the listeners know that me and Kmac are going to be experimenting uh, with a. Uh, we're going to start being training partners. We're going to be tra- we're going to be part- buddying up and uh, seeing what we can do. But I've been in a bit of a lull in my training uh, w- with regards to the gym I'm at, so I decided to uh, decided to jump in with Kmac at uh, his gym and uh, see what we can do to take things to the next level. Keep your day on us. And on that note, thanks for listening and. Uh, Goodbye.